In my short time, I'd just like to highlight what I think are three sources of these trade disputes that we're here to talk about today, and then what they imply for the prospects for the future. Uh, number one, uh, the charges that Chinese companies have been stealing U.S. property. Uh, it is true that for years, some enterprises in China have been making knockoffs of CDs and movies and selling them without sending uh, re revenues to Warner Brothers, or, and Warner Brothers not happy about it. And the U.S. government, of course, has been trying to induce, coerce other governments into enforcing our intellectual property rights laws in their jurisdictions with some success. I remember s periodically the governments in China have had bonfires of CDs uh, as a way to try to get the point across to their enterprises. But some of this is probably still going on. There's also allegations uh, we've heard that Chinese groups with state affiliations have been using the internet or other means to steal business secrets of U.S. enterprises. I don't have any uh, personal information about that. I hope my colleagues can say more about it. Uh, we do know that the U.S. government um, has uh, used offensive cyber attacks against other governments and uh, probably has much greater capabilities of doing that than China or Russia. But our politicians and media don't talk about that side of it, leaving probably many Americans with one-sided interpretations of these disputes. The other governments, though, do know about it, and understanding that may help us understand the international relations around these issues. A second source of these disputes, um, I would identify uh, differences between domestic institutions in different countries engaged in trade and investment. U.S. executives also complain that when they've gone to invest in China, uh, the government has, has forced them to agree to transfer technology to their Chinese partners. To me, I think it's misleading to lump that together with cheating and not playing by the rules, since uh, it seems to me that's the Chinese government uh, exercising its sovereignty over its territory the way we all do. Come on in. There's lots of seats in the front and in the back and in the middle. The companies didn't actually have to transfer the technology. They could have walked away from the investment, but of course they didn't want to lose the huge market. So it probably felt like coercion to them, but uh, that is something many countries around the world have felt uh, from the United States as well, uh, contrary to what our current president would, would have us believe. But the U.S. executives are naturally wanting the U.S. government to improve their bargaining position on these issues in China. But the international rules don't require uh, Brazil, China, Japan, Germany to adopt domestic institutions just like ours. And probably most countries in the world uh, that use a basically market-oriented uh, strategy have stronger states and, and more extensive regulation than our country does. In fact, during the Cold War, uh, the, Korean, the, the communist states of Eastern Europe were members of the GATT. Those rules, the GATT and the WTO, were written primarily to encourage an opening of markets among mainly market-oriented societies and the resolution of disputes between those governments. China, as uh, Clay mentioned, has been a member since 2001 of the WTO. And China's uh, growth since Deng Xiaoping has been mostly in the market side of the economy, outside the plan, outside the state-owned enterprises. Um, the authorities use their authority to encourage market competition in many sectors. Uh, many Chinese enterprises, as you know, have floated shares on world stock markets and are now owned today by many capitalist portfolio managers. Some of those enterprises have opened uh, branches in the United States. You can walk into a branch of the Bank of China in the United States. You can open a savings account. It will be protected, insured by the U.S. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. It looks very much like a commercial bank. But uh, it's a little bit different, different from what it looks like. A uh, majority of the shares are owned by a, an agency of the Chinese government. And in general, China's political and economic institutions have evolved um, since 2001 in ways that have become sui generis, almost uh, unlike those of any other country. 
Um, there are a number of examples of this. I don't have enough time to develop them. But it means that the economy has, has moved away from the rules that were written at the time when China was moving into the WTO. They did try in that accession port protocol to anticipate the problems that might arise that are distinctive to China. And they did anticipate some of them. Uh, and some disputes between China and its partners have been settled under the WTO, some 30 of them, uh, since that time. But they didn't anticipate the changes that took place beginning under Hu Jintao to lead China's institutions today not to really match any of the models that were in mind at the time those rules were written. So for one, one quick example, not so new, but easy to convey in, in 30 seconds, uh, the state and the party in China are not quite the same institution. They both have authority, but they are parallel institutions, right? So uh, in all of these big institutions like the Bank of China, there are party members. There has to be a party committee anytime there's three party members in any institution. The minutes of the party committee are not made public. The party has been known to rotate the chief executives of enterprises from one to the other or into the government and out into the en enterprises, sometimes without consulting the board of directors of the company who report to the shareholders who include those shareholders outside the country. And so the United States, but also other countries, have complained, some of them, well, China does not really have a market-oriented economy. This is not like ours, and it maybe doesn't qualify under the rules. But the Chinese representatives point to the written agreements and say, where does it say that a party is a state body? It's not. It's not in there. So disputes have arisen uh, over the interpretation of the existing rules and, and the fact that the WTO also has not managed to change any rules, written any universal rules since the 1990s. So uh, disputes of these first two types have arisen a long time in international history, and a lot of them have been resolved, including among China. And today might, might, might have been resolved, but my guess is not under the current U.S. president, which brings me to, to source number three, Donald Trump, and particularly his preferences and his ignorance about international trade. I'm sorry, but I think that's an accurate statement, and I think it's central to the issues before this uh, roundtable. Uh, he is an old-fashioned protectionist in the sense of before the 1930s. It seems, and I take him at his word on trade because he's been saying the same things for years before he ran to be president. He seems to think of trade between countries as though it's the same between two individuals. So if I s sell uh, to Hu Jintao and he buys less from me than I'm, than I'm paying him, he's getting money from me, I'm losing. Uh, what a bum deal. Trump doesn't seem to understand or accept uh, the findings widely understood by any student of economics that when countries open to trade, they benefit from trade in the sense it's not true of an individual. They, they shift the structural structure of the economy out of less efficient into more efficient sectors, meaning higher per capita income in the, in the economy, even though a minority of individuals might, might be losing. Economies from both parties tell us that the main cause of the external deficits that the United States has with China and with the whole world are not due to trade policy. They're due primarily to macroeconomic conditions and differences in macroeconomic conditions between countries. For example, in our country, we buy more than we make. So where's the extra stuff going to come from? Well, it's got to come from outside. So. We can put up barriers to Chinese goods and, and maybe effectively keep them out, but as long as we keep buying more than we're making, we're going to be bringing it in from somewhere else, but at a higher price. And so the result is lower standard of living for us, same goods at a higher price, and no change to the trade deficit. Trump also doesn't seem to understand that the United States, uniquely almost in the world, is able to run a limited deficit in its external accounts almost indefinitely because of the special role of the dollar in the international monetary system. He doesn't seem to grasp that the huge fiscal stimulus bill that he signed in December, which is going to increase federal deficits uh, dramatically, is going to increase the external trade deficit that drives him up the wall and that he's trying to address with tariffs. Now others working for Trump are not ignorant, but they're not president. 
Well, Trump, in, in the case of China, has made extreme demands, basically give up your, your fundamental development model, and if you don't, I'm going to hit you with tariffs. Um, so he sacrificed what might have been gained through a joint gain negotiating strategy. And I suspect the goal in Washington is actually not to reach an agreement with China, but instead to install permanent uh, barriers against Chinese imports. What are the prospects? And to conclude, I doubt actually that China or the European Union is going to buckle. Uh, South Korea did drop some concessions on the table. Mexico may have buckled this week. Canada may be in the process of buckling today. But I think China and the EU are different. I, my bet is that the United States is going to have a different president in less than two and a half years. And my, I suspect that they are hoping and betting on that as well. And they're probably calculating that uh, to buckle now uh, would damage their long-term interests more than they're suffering from the, the tariff surcharges now. So my guess of the pro and they know that that strong lobbies in the United States are complaining to their senators about uh, Trump on trade. And so in trade, an agreement has to be ratified by the Congress. So Trump's credibility is, is in question, whether he can actually deliver. So I think these conflicts will end when a US president decides he wants or she wants to settle. And then it will be either a just a face-saving symbolic agreement to end the, the barriers, or possibly even a joint gain deal if the United States offers to make some market opening here in return for other companies, countries making market opening over there, uh, and the kind that we've seen in the past. This will require some compromise from China to reach such an agreement. And if they're not willing to compromise, uh, then we probably will seek a continuation of more disputes like types one and two. Thank you.